zchut avot. We need to pray in merit and, and, and of our ancestors and, and act in their ways. If we want to trigger that beautiful blessing of what it means to have zchut avot, have merit of our forefathers and our ancestors, we need to tap into it. We tap into it by acting like them. God delivers the ten plagues to the Egyptians on behalf of the Jewish people. And Paro and his nation, they're stubborn. They don't get it. It's all ten plagues till finally after that final tenth plague. Not only when all of the firstborn Egyptians pass away, but Paro's own firstborn passes away. He finally gives in and says, let them go. Just get them out of here. And the Torah tells us how Paro even rushed and he got the Egyptians to rush them out. Get all of these Israelites out quickly. And so it was. Now, if anyone pays attention, this might be a, a novelty to some, but Rashi himself says this, this chidush. He says in verse 5 in chapter 14 that Paro actually sent some how do we say, some escorts with the Jewish people in order to see where they're actually going, if they're actually going to do what they were asked or being asked to do, which was to go serve God on a mountain three days away. Very nice. So Paro sends these spies, these escorts, these guards, sends them along with the Jewish people. Three days into their voyage, they're a little bit distorted. The Jewish people... <coughs> don't know where to go. They head straight, right, left. It seemed like some type of a confusion. And as we know, they actually came to the Sea of Reeds. Not the Red Sea, that's a big mistake. It's a typo. The Sea of Reeds. And Yamsuf. And right away, these guards, they run back to Paro and they say, Paro, it was all a lie. They don't know where they're going. And then on days five and six, Paro catches up to the Jewish people. So again, the first three days they were traveling. They got there, they're distorted. They run back, takes them a day to go get Paro, these, these guards. Now they come on day five and six to catch up. And now they're about to attack. And that's when God performs a beautiful miracle and he separates the Jewish people and the Egyptians with a pillar of fire. Now this pillar of fire stood until the sea splits, the Jewish people enter, and then the pillar vanishes, and then the Egyptians follow in after. And that happened exactly on the seventh day from the day of Exodus. And as Rashi tells us, that's why we read the, this part, this portion of Parashat B'Shalach, on the seventh day of Pesach, commemorating what happened on the seventh day since the, since the Exodus. So this is what exactly is happening. Now, right after the Jewish people enter the sea, and then they're passing through, Moses, being the leader, emerges from the sea onto the dry land, and God commands, and I'll quote, this is in chapter 14, verse 26. Vayomer Adonai el Moshe. God tells Moses, Nete et yadecha al hayam. Stretch out your hand over the sea. Vyashuvu hamaim al hamitzrim al richbo ve'al parashav. And let the water return on the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So God tells Moses, come out, stretch out your arm, and now let the water come and drown all of the Egyptians. Very nice. Now, the Ma'amloez goes on to explain that this punishment was tailor-made specifically for the Egyptians. What did they do? Well, we read in the parashah of Shemot, they said, Havanit hakemalo, let's get smart, let's outwit the Jewish people, and more importantly, their God. What did they say? We're going to take all the, first the, the, all the Jewish boys that are born, and we're going to throw them into the Nile River. Why would they do that? Why didn't they burn them? Why didn't they crucify them? Why didn't they just 
shoot them, cut them, chas v'shalom, so many horrible things. But why did they choose specifically to throw them into the river? Well, their great advisor said, we know in the time of Noah, God made a pact. He said that never again will he bring a flood upon the world. Yet what they didn't know was that was a pact to destroy the whole world. But one country and even one nation, God could <clears throat> punish them back for, uh, by means of water. So knowing the Egyptians, look how great they were in, in some twisted way. They knew that God's way of operating was midah keneged midah, measure for measure. If you do this, well, you'll get that back, whether it's for the good or for the bad. So they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to outwit and we're going to outsmart their God. We're going to do something horrible to the Jews in a way that God can't repay us. But obviously we know they made a mistake. And this was the moment of truth. This was when they were being paid back for throwing the Jewish baby boys into the Nile River. And so it was. The next verse says, Vayet Moshe et yado al hayam. Moses stretches out his hand over the sea. Vayashov hayam lifnot boker leetano. And the sea returns to its strength in the morning. So Moses was commanded by God to stretch his hand out to have the water return. Next verse, verse 27, Moses does that. The Midrash Rabbah, right over here on this pasuk, tells us this word etano is an interesting word. Etano referring to its strength, that the water went back to its strength. The Midrash says something deeper is going on over here. You know what Letano is? Letano is the same letters as Litna'o. In Hebrew, the word Tenai is a condition. It's a pact. And Letano could be rearranged to be read as Litna'o, not to its strength, but rather to its condition, to its pact. This is what the Midrash says. Now the Zerah Shimshon explains what that exactly means, and that means that on the third day of creation, when the water and the land was separated, then God now, He says, and He makes a special condition with the water, with actually, as it's brought down, as the angel of the water, Sar Shel Hayam, and tells Him, these are your rules of nature. Okay? H2O. Humans can't breathe in the water. Fish could. You have amphibians that can do a little bit of both. Okay. All these type of, of rules. Another beautiful part of nature of water is that when water freezes in a cup, so to say, the whole thing freezes. The way oceans not really oceans, but more rivers or lakes freeze, is only the top layer freezes and it floats, which is a, a scientific anomaly. doesn't really make sense for it to float. It should really sink. But God in His ultimate chesed and His loving kindness said that if the first layer would always freeze up and then move down, it would kill all of the fish life under. So there are a couple of rules of nature. We don't need to go on and on and on to explain all the rules of nature. Obviously, gravity... But within these rules of nature, God tells the sea that you need to split when commanded to. When the Jewish people are going to come and need this water to be split, you split. So it was part of the rules and the conditions for this very, uh, how do we say, organism, which is the sea, the water. Very nice. Being that... The Zer Shimshon says, why does the Torah hint to and allude to this condition that God made with the water after the fact? When should this condition have been alluded to in the Torah? Before the Jewish people enter, before the water's opening, when Moses comes and the water's not opening, that's when, right before it's about to open, that's when the Torah should allude to le le'etano, which means litnao, to its power, which would really mean to its condition. 
Yet it's referred to and alluded to afterwards, after it splits, after the Jewish people enter, and then the Jewish people exit. That's when that pact is reminded. Again, the Zer Shimshon is bothered. If the water needs to heed to its condition, let the condition be mentioned, and then let the water open. Why right when it's about to close down is that condition mentioned? It's a marvelous question. It's a beautiful question. Zer Shimshon answers, and he brings a source from the Zohar. The Zohar tells us something extra the Midrash didn't tell us. And that's the beauty of sometimes learning different sources. The Zohar tells us that the condition God made with the water, with the sea, with the ocean, was that it will open up for the Jewish people and that it will come down and destroy the Egyptians who are following. The way the Zer Shimshon learns the Zohar is that it was twofold. There was two conditions God made. Number one, to split. Number two, to come down and kill the Egyptians. Accordingly, it makes most sense to allude to this condition right at the moment where it's going to fulfill both of these conditions. Okay? So the question was, why this timing? Answer was, well, now is because both conditions are being fulfilled. The Zeshim Shon continues and asks a brilliant question. He says, what was the need for a condition for the water to return to its natural state? Again, the water split and it was up, as the Torah says, erected on the right and on the left, and the Jewish people were able to enter in the inside, in the middle. Why does God need to make a condition, according to the Zohar, Zer Shimshon asks, why does God need to make a condition for the water to come crashing down and kill the Egyptians? Water by nature drowns, destroys, comes crashing down, re resorting back to its natural state of gravity. What's the purpose of that second condition? It's something quite obvious. So the Zer Shimshon answers and he says, there was an accusation on the Jewish people. There were many angels who came before God and told God, we understand you promised the forefathers of this nation, specifically Abraham, that they will be redeemed from the land of Egypt. We get that they need to be redeemed. However, they're not worthy of it. They were at the lowest level of impurity right before the end. They didn't merit it. Some of these angels came and told God, and they said, we'll leave you or we'll understand. Look at the angels speaking to God. We understand how you need to take these Jewish people out. But to kill the Egyptians along the way, that's not fair. So obviously we have a rebuttal to this claim and this accusation. Well, the Egyptians didn't need to burden and, and enslave the Jewish people in the ways and the forms that they did. But nevertheless, the sea could have come and claimed, why should I open up and why should I come crashing down on the Egyptians? They don't really deserve to die. So all the way in the time of creation, when God created the sea, when God created the ocean, He said, not only will you open up condition number one for the Jews, you're going to come crashing down on the Egyptians, no questions asked. On that, the Zer Shimshon asks one more question. Okay, we got it. One condition, two conditions, both are needed, both during the creation of the ocean. Why does Moses need to? Why does God need to tell Moses? And Moses actually has to stand up, raise his hand over the sea in order for this condition to be fulfilled. If there were conditions made to take place and the sea was going to do it anyways, why did God need Moses to, so to say, activate it? So listen to this, and this is fascinating. You don't have this in the English version. That's why if any of you read a little bit in the English version, the Zer Shimshon continued in the Hebrew version and says as follows. God, in many things that he did for the exodus of Egypt, and specifically now, even during the splitting of the sea, he did things in a grand way, in a special, miraculous way, in order to show his awesomeness, his grandeur. So look at what God did. The Jews actually 
were still part of the Jews, were actually still in the sea while the water came crashing down on the Egyptians. And what did it do, the way the Zeshim Shun explains is, the water selectively drowned and, and hurt the Egyptians and was still dry land as a walkway for those Jews able to be in there. And that was an extra miracle. God didn't need to do that. He could have had the Jews pass, all get out, and then have the water close. No, God made it that the Egyptians actually caught up and, and passed even some of the Jews. But at that moment when the water came crashing down, it still was dry for the Jews that were still in the sea, and the Egyptians were drowned. And for such a miracle, God wanted, and this is the way the Zeshem Shun explains, God wanted Moses to stand up, raise his hand, and activate and show this very special miracle that was about to take place. So these two conditions were extremely important. And why was it mentioned now? Well, that's when the second condition was taking place. And Moses' hand was lifted over in order to show what a very special and selective miracle God was now doing. Again, God's done it before. He'd done it by almost all the plagues it was selective. Yet again, he comes and he stamps his, his identity of being able to know who people are. Something which as mortals were not able to do. Only those who are infinite, not finite beings, are able to de detect Jewish, Egyptian, deserve to drown, not deserve to drown, in order to make the miracle even grander and more awesome. This is what the Zer Shimshon uh, explains. I saw the Me'amloez, believe it or not, brings the same question and gives another answer. The Me'amloez says a fascinating answer. He says, that all of the miracles that happened during the Exodus, from the plagues to everything along, even the Exodus itself and the splitting of the sea and the drowning of the Egyptians, all of this, this era and these episodes all happened then and they will all happen again by the final redemption. Right before Mashiach, there will be a similar form of all of these ten plagues and the exodus and the splitting of the sea, it might not be in a way that we can imagine now. I guess that Hashem Hashem will give us the, the merit to, to witness it and to see God's, God's splendor and grandeur. But he proves it from a pasuk in Micha. Pasuk in Micha says as follows, As in the days when you came out of Egypt, Ar'enu niflaot. I will show them my wonders. And the prophet Micha is prophesizing what it will be like in the time of the Mashiach, right before the Mashiach comes. That God will show His wonders in a similar way and miracles in a similar way to the way it was done in Egypt. Accordingly, the Ma'am Loez explains that the reason for this condition was not for a one-time use. The condition that God created the water in, in order to split, was not one time by the exodus of Egypt for the Jewish people then. It was actually any time the Jewish people need water to be split for them in order to pass, and those who are coming are worthy of it being split, it would split. He proves, he says, that when the Jewish people entered in the time of Joshua to the land of Israel, how did they enter? Well, they crossed over the Jordan River. The Jordan River split for them. Um, the Talmud refers to Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair, that he was traveling, and there was a river in front of him, and being such a holy tzaddik as he was, tik-tak, he had kriyat yamsuf, as if it was nothing. So, the Mi'amloa says, you know why? Back to the Zeshem Shon's original question. You know why this allusion of le'etano, meaning litnao, to its condition, is now referred to after the fact? Because if it was told to us before the actual miracle took place, we would have thought that the condition was only for this. But since the condition was alluded to after the miracle of the splitting of the sea took place, it was to show us that this was an everlasting condition that not, it was not a one-time occurrence, it would be any time the Jewish people want the water to split, that it would be able to be split. So I, brought, I wanted to bring two lessons out from this, this episode, and the first being, look how precise and exact our Torah is. 
the illusion of a concept and a condition which was done in the time of creation back down to thousands of years later to the ex 2448 years later and when is it alluded to? Is it alluded to before the miracle happened or after the miracle happened? The Torah is exact and it's precise, it's infinite wisdom and by us learning and continue delving into it we will see more and more and more.